Good afternoon. Here again with a uh, sustainable ROM Summit episode. And today talking with Sebastian. And Sebastian is from Germany. Uh, and Sebastian is the owner of El Ron del Artesano. Uh, welcome, Sebastian, to the um, to this episode for 2021. Uh, we just discussed over the phone on uh, snow is coming to Europe here in the Netherlands and yes. Germany. So I'm looking forward to it and I can slay with my daughter. Um, but people want to know who and who what is Sebastian? So, could you kindly introduce yourself? <laughs> yes, welcome, Pedro. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your time and the interview, of course. And just to give you, yeah, let's say a short introduction, what I'm doing, what I started and everything. Um, we might talk about this quite a long time, but I think I'll make it uh, quick, quick and a little bit short. So, um, as you said, my name is Sebastian. I, I studied winemaking. That's, uh, let's say, my, my base, where, where I came from. And I came into the rum business in a quite strange way. Let's say we got uh, the right to produce alcohol here to distill in Germany since 1880. So, um, like 141 years. And uh, my great-grandfather was not only distilling, but he was also a cooper. So he produced uh, barrels. And, uh, yes... That was uh, more or less his work. And when I started all this, I was looking for, let's say, I was into rum, but never get it why it's sweetened, why there's anything added and all this kind of stuff. That was quite strange to me because I came more from the agricole side to, mm -hmm. to the rum. So I was not drinking so much of the sweet stuff and all this. I, I didn't really understand, but I understood that for many people, it was a quite, let's say, difficult entry level with the agricole to get in touch with rum because it's really nice, but it's often not the easiest start. And uh, that's yeah, what I what I tried to, to develop also with Artesano when I started it. I was looking for a really good quality, a really good producer, giving me a really good quality in molasses rum, um, but not adding anything. So artesano is like the word, like the sense of the word artesano, which means more or less craftsman. You can translate it as craftsman in English. And that was the idea to make a crafted rum, not an industrial produ produced rum with basic quality and then everything adjusted, but uh, to do it another way around. Of course, I was too, too little and too small to, to buy a distillery to get it started mm. from this point. Um, so if you have zero sales, no market and nothing, uh, it would have been quite crazy and no money. <laughs> or at least uh, just finished studies, started to work and uh, not the chance to, to really build, build an own distillery. So I started to buy from Barela to make mm -hmm. uh, also this part of the story complete. And uh, I started to, to get samples before from, from quite a lot of producers and then I decided to start with them because this was the kind of profile I liked for, for the way I was thinking to produce the rum. It was a good quality. I liked their way of working. When you're in the rum business, of course, there's, there are many things really good, but many things are not so well organized yet or well structured. Also, the things about sustainability, it's a growing thing. A lot of people into it and giving giving their best and doing really really hard work on on getting everything fixed and to to bring it on a better track. But yeah, uh, yeah yet it's uh, a time where you have how, to. Yeah. How did you start then? In the sense that you want to produce your rum, you you're reaching out to potential rum producers. Where to start? Uh, just Google it, like rum producer. Latin America, no additives, uh, organic, etc. Or uh, how did you? No, it was really more about about reading everything I knew from from the books and everything all about the producers because I already was into rum, but more as a rum drinker. So I started to write down each time when I've seen a distillery or something, and I was looking who is producing it because also you know there are so many labels on the market, but a lot of times you don't know who's the producer behind, or at least you don't know who's the distillery behind. So I was trying to find out who is it and then started to ask for really undiluted, not changed cask samples. So really let's, let's say the, the, the normal quality they got in, in stock aging, 
nothing mm -hmm. changed, not diluted down, nothing added. So I really wanted like the raw product to to taste it and to see the the style. Because of course, if you start such such a thing or such a brand, you need to develop your own style. And I thought, what are my strengths? What can I do? What others are not so so fast in, or what what do I know? And as I mentioned, I studied winemaking, so I was more into this kind of wine stuff, and got some quite good connections to wine producers. And that's how it all started. I thought, okay, if I take really good casks, use them fresh just empty them don't leave anything inside so you can really measure my runs there's no sugar left so i don't do a so-called wet cask style and leave 10 liters of anything inside um, but that was the the style i wanted to develop and barela was the kind of rum that perfect perfectly fit into that you know people are a lot into this this high easter stuff and everything this is really nice for bourbon barrel aging and all this but what I wanted to do was completely other way. I wanted to, like, let's say, catch people who are drinking sweet rum and bring them to the other side of, of rum, to the unsweetened stuff and, like, to, let's say, to build, like, a little bridge, not being too tough regarding the style and too powerful, but also not producing something boring and industrial. So, let's say the, the Don Papa drinkers... If, if um, you want to change a bit their flavor profile, uh, your rum would be a good start, let's say, to take them gradually to, for instance, the rum agricole, so to speak. Yeah, let's say I, I wanted to show the people that there's a way in between. And I don't mm. mean a way in between, which means 20 grams of sugar. I'm still talking about zero, or let's say zero to five, whatever you get out of the wood. But I wanted to, yeah, to show them that there's a way without adding sugar. Or adding and, and do you, sweet liquids. Yeah. And and I think you have quite a lot of data then gathered based on your yeah. experience and your testing, etc. to um, um, yeah. that has a certain value for going forward in, in, in trying out other things. Yeah. Uh, you have your barrel expertise, uh, a bit of the wine background. Uh, do you see, are you the only one that's experimenting in its way or do you see also other no there, are, up, uh, no, there are yeah. also also others that produce this kind of, yeah, not exactly this kind of rum, but I think there are also others, you know, this kind of finishing and everything is a quite old story. Mm -hmm. well, it's, yeah, more or less old, but a uh, story that a lot of people use. It comes from whiskey, goes through the rum business, and it's not, a lot of people are using this kind of finishes. It's just about how to manage it, how to age it. And there are so many little steps, you know, like which kind of alcohol level or which kind of ABV do you put into your cask to get out the perfect flavor profile, which also changes the, the result. So if you put it in at 75 or if you put it in at 65 or 58 or 57 or whatever, it changes a lot. So, do, you, do you do you also gather data from from others then that are doing this kind of piloting and testing and research that you can compare they, your research what you're doing and then also with others do you see that you can can you find it online can you talk with other um, either brands and, and and producers that are doing a similar thing or is it a, quite a close community that it's not much shared because maybe no one ever asks I don't know for me. Uh, Let's say if you if you go to trade fairs and everything, I really love to taste and go around and just talk to the guys standing there. A lot of times it's not the producer himself. It's just, um, yeah, somebody, a commercial sure. yeah, sales, sales rep who, who's doing the presentation. So it's quite difficult to get really technical information. And the rum business to me, it's still, let's say, there. I don't know exactly how to describe it in a nice way, but on the one hand there are guys who own the distilleries who got their yeah their production fully controlled and everything and on the other hand there are the guys who are bottling rum and selling it and then you have you have to divide this group i think because right now there's like sometimes i see it also on facebook in discussions and everything and also in posts that there's let's say not the friendliest way of handling each other mm. 
it's more like mm -hmm. you're seen as an independent bottler just gaining from uh, yeah from what somebody else produced but i th i think it's it's not the correct way if also if you're talking about terroir for example this is often something they say you know terroir is where the rum is aged but to me it goes much deeper and in my opinion you know sugarcane is is able to yeah <laughs> to work with so many minerals it there's so many water so it's it's much more than you can get from grain or anything it's like I see it more next to wine than I see it next to grain. If people start to compare with whiskey, I think it's it's the wrong way. So terroir starts in the in the sugar cane. So it's not not only about where it's aged. And sometimes it's yeah, it seems like they they define it as as where it's been aged. So if it's continental aged or if it's uh, yeah, Caribbean aged or whatever. So this is more. The problem I see because you don't get really in touch with the people because I don't know it's not like uh, sometimes not like friendship it's more like okay somebody else is bottling and of course it's like this it's uh, let's say anybody can pour a liquid into a bottle that's my way of hard definition but um, it depends yeah about your I don't know how to say it in English credo what you think mm -hmm. and what you want to reach and if you talk about sustainability depends where you're sourcing your rum how are you producing it what kind of yeah everything you're using what what do you put into your product it's not about am i doing this only to to make money is the question i need to ask myself or is it because i love rum or because i love my project because i love what i'm doing and because i want to develop it this is the most important question i think you know uh, if you are a guy selling now rum and in five years, if there's something else, tequila or I don't know what, it's, uh, yeah, let's say it's about money, but not about your, yeah, your way. And this and then, is something really important to me. Then I guess you also have a very good relationship, an open relationship with the producer uh, yes, in Panama, where you together then look into what can we improve looking at terroir, looking at all those elements uh to make it better i suppose and 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 where you also provide input uh let's say more from your research con uh, contact mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. yeah your experience also for the european market correct yeah let's say yeah in some way it's correct because uh you need to know they're not so not so small of course so for them they they need to produce a certain amount to be yeah to be working and uh let's say but they are yeah they are listening if you if you got input and they are also we are in good contact and if you ask them for example we last time we discussed about a way of fermentation and everything if we could do a project in this way or if we need to build up really a small site anywhere in panama to to get that managed and then organize together the distillation process so I think it's it's yet nothing to be discussed about because it's not fixed, but there are a lot of ways to uh, yeah to get to get it to a right point. Let's say it maybe like this. And and then why is sustainability um, an important or a factor to you in, in doing business and developing your product? Let's say in in my opinion, it's uh, nothing you can. Right now, it's already difficult to discuss it away to say, okay, I don't want to be sustainable. Who wants to say that? Nobody. A lot of people are, if they, I don't know, if they see the money, then they start to, to forget sustainability. A lot of times, I think, if they realize, okay, if I want to be sustainable, I have to pay more. I have to pay more for packaging. I have to pay more for my raw material and everything. So it's often put apart, but let's say if you want to, to do an honest work and to be, uh, I think sustainability is something if you want to survive in future times with your business and, and what you are doing. And if you really love what you are doing, it's nothing you need to discuss about. It's just one basic factor that needs to be done. So it's not one. I got one funny story. One guy once told me I'm sustainable because I don't want to waste money was like uh, I'm reusing all the water I got because I don't want to waste water, neither water nor money. 
I'm using solar panels because I don't want to waste energy and so on. And he said, yeah, that, that was a quite impressive guy who told me it's, it also helps yourself. And he said, I'm not, this was a vintner. So he said, I don't want to pollute nature because the next generation will pay for it. So it will be destroyed. Now I'll make the money and the next generation will not. So it depends. And I was, I was born in a family with uh, 140 years in spirit business. So um, we are not so into, yeah, let's say my father never taught me to do something that's just for one year or two years working, but to think about what, what will happen in 30 years, even if it's not your business anymore. And then taking that sustainability and what is happening now and what will happen in the future. Do you see then in Germany mainly uh, or around Europe, do you see also consumer, consumer interest more and more into that a product or spirit has to be more transparent uh, in looking at labeling, looking at sustainability yeah. and more? Uh, and how do you deal with that? Mm. Let's say yes and no. I try to be, uh, yeah, I try to communicate everything honestly. So if somebody wants to know something and he's asking me, I tell them, write me an email or just call me and I'll give you all the answers you need. That's my way of handling it. But to get back to your question, I think in some way, yes, and in some way, no. I think the market is like splitting up a little bit. A lot of people say, okay, I want sustainability. I don't want this planet to be wasted for generations and don't want to pollute it. And other people might say it, but at the end, as I said, if it costs a little bit more or yeah, if you can just consume one bottle instead of two, because it costs a little bit more, then they skip away and say, okay, sustainability is okay but i think that's also something about regulation and everything so i think energy is regulated by itself because it will become so expensive in future years that all of us one are interested in in being sustainable yeah then it comes to like you said saving money uh in the end uh yeah, with the solar that's... panel or etc uh it, it, on the German side, is there any support then um, from the, either the municipality or the government uh, to, uh, let's say, be a bit more sustainable as a business, uh, as a spirit business, so to speak? Uh, let's say, yes, there is in some ways, as they supported all the solar and everything. This, this is working in quite a good way. Or for example, right now, ele electronic cars and or electrified cars are are supported quite good by, by German government. Uh, but let's say for us in future, I think it's, it's even more interesting to go more on the production side and see what we can do there. Because yeah. I think this is the, the place where most waste is, is produced at the end. So we can yeah. think about where do we source our bottles, but this is a problem because uh, there are only a few really, really big glass producers left, but we can look at where do I get the corks from, capsules, uh, the boxes, for example. Where do I buy them? All this kind of stuff. I think often you say so little things, it's not worth to look for it. But I think the opposite way, I think even the little part you should have an eye on. And then at the end, it also changes a lot. Yeah, true. And then let's say you have your you have your product. Uh, you had a bottle with you, right? Can you, yeah. can you show us a little <laughs> bit on that? I have to plug in my. Exactly. So uh, it's COVID, so many stores are closed. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, this yes. is a logo that or uh, that, that you designed, or that you, it, it was your idea to have. Um, yeah, let's say <laughs> this, the idea was, you know, I, uh, yeah, we need to start a bit earlier. I think um, it was like the rum was a dream. And what I always uh, had was a quite good relation with my grandma. And she loves to show pictures and talking about family history and everything. And she showed me those pictures of her father doing, doing his work. And when I started the rum, yeah. I was like, okay, this is what I want. And I gave a, a girl, I gave the picture 
as a yeah just as a scan mailed it to her and asked her if she can if she can design it or if she can just uh, print uh, the great grandfather and and draw it so that was what she did at the end and it was just it took uh, two times the second time it was like okay now it's perfect i want it and i i haven't changed yeah, it well, since then so it's eight years old now the picture and yeah Uh, and it gives a bit of added value, I think, to, uh, like you said, it, um, it's not an industrial produced product. No, it's, we know it's craft distilling, but it has that personal touch and, and let's say history track to it. But then you have the bottle in your hand, you go to different stores, uh, maybe different distributors. Um, how do you, what, what are your learnings in, in then telling your brand and, and finding collaborations with, um, uh, either the on and off trade. I would say the, the market, as we all know, is really packed, is really full. So I try a lot about uh, letting them taste. So I try to often send samples and just give them a short, short and quick possibility just to try one sample and get to know the idea behind because I think that's the easiest way. And of course, it took me now eight years to get into some some distributors and everything into their their shops and or regarding the all the contacts to importers and everything. But there, at the end, the rum rum world is still still small, and people who are looking for crafted rum and sustainable rum, they are more let's say, yeah, together in a group. So. A lot of times it's also about, yeah, let's say I don't got the big marketing uh, machinery, not the machinery and not the marketing money. So a lot of times it really helps that other people tell other people, hey, I tasted artesano and it was really nice. Try, give it a try. And yeah, then they get in touch with it because, yeah, I try to travel as much as possible. But at the end, my work is still to, yeah to supervise production, to do everything, to handle the cask, which is still, as we are aging now, almost 500 casks. So it's uh, full time. <laughs> it's a full time. And, and you got quite a, let's say, a, a product range re lay, laid out, uh, also with the uh, finish in port cask, for instance. Uh, then you travel yourself. You're the cask master then, eh? based yeah. on your, <laughs> your background. Uh, what is important then uh, about the cask and selecting a barrel? Uh, what are the main characteristics that you focus on? Let's say for me, it's important which kind of wood is used. So normally it's oak, but it depends also a lot uh, where the oak is grown and which type of oak. So this is, this is quite yeah. important to me. And then what was inside before, because I don't want to buy when I, when I started it, I tasted some stuff and I was like, okay, I don't like the wine which was inside or the port wine that was aged inside. Why should I take the cask? Because at the end, if I don't like the first product that was inside, I don't want to get this aroma profile into the rum. So it took me quite some time to find producers where I say, okay, I really love the product, what they are doing. And it's also, yeah, a lot about... Yeah, about smelling, it's really touching the casks, checking wood quality, everything. It's a lot about, about this. It's not so scientific at the end. But then you look for, then I think a pitfall might be, because you're looking for consistency, let's say, from these casks. Right? They can say, well, I want to continue yeah. the baseline for the, uh, this port level cask. That's the smell I want to buy again in two years' time and next year. Yeah. Maybe then it's out. So then you, your flavor profile might also change uh, directly, let's say, uh, yeah, because so, you can't find that specific cask anymore. Or yeah, anymore. no, no, you need, you need good uh, providers of your, yeah, of your casks and really guys you trust. So because uh, if you don't get them fresh, if they clean it in the wrong way or anything, you don't get the same taste. And their, yeah. let's say, the, the quality of their product needs, needs to be stable too, to give you the same flavor profile. So, but yeah, so. yeah. it took me some time. I really, I, I got some producers where I really sorted out the casks and at the end sold the rum as bulk to the market because I, I said I'm not able to sell this under my brand because 
the cast seemed to be good, but at the end, it, yeah, also like like all the time, nobody taught me this. So it takes some time to get your own experience and to get in touch with this and to learn how to how to manage it and how to check whether it's good or not. Um, if you look at certain trends, and I had an interview uh, already a few weeks ago on uh, what I see now is the spice rum, botanical rum. Is that also something that you're considering? You're entering into that space? To be honest, no. <laughs> <laughs> but this is more, yeah, as you said before, the, the added value with a with great-grandfather on the label. A lot of times I say it's not not the added value for the customer, it's more for myself. When I see, you know, when I see the, the bottle in, in the shelf or if I go to a shop and sometimes a distributor sells it to somebody and you don't even know that it's that it's there, that it's sold there. And then you get you get in and you see the label, it more it makes me proud more than adding a value to the bottle yeah. that there's my great grandfather on it. So yeah. That's more, yeah, let's say I'm proud about this and I don't want to, how do you say, I don't want to offend what he did. My grandma told me yeah. he was always really, really, uh, let's say what he said he did. So he was not skipping each week his kind of working because somebody told him you made 10, 10 bucks more if you do it that way. So really yeah. honest and let's say... Yeah, let's say also rough guy, she told me. He was always, if he wanted something, he did it exactly that way. And that's something when I said, I, I want rum, when I started this product uh, project, I was like, I want to rum without anything added. Aged in cask, of course, that adds flavor, but not no flavors added artificially, neither by pouring in liters of, of sherry or something just an honest an honest product and i i couldn't do it i think it's also not yeah not correct to to do it under another brand because i love what i'm doing here and if i would start now a second brand like a spiced brand called i don't know el rondel industrial whatever <laughs> for me it would be like i couldn't couldn't look in the mirror each morning for me it would be impossible it's more like yeah i don't know yeah well, stick to your principles i think that's good and and i think it's part of being an entrepreneur that uh, maybe people will call you crazy that you continue going this way but that's your vision and uh, you did your either research investigation and you have your gut feeling that's okay uh, but in the end i think this will be successful at least for me uh and you can look into the mirror every night and you say i'm yeah, proud of a... what i've which then, yeah, I did it on my own, for instance. Huh? You know, sometimes you see easier ways or you think, okay, it's easier to sell it that way if I give it a little bit sugar or something. And then at the end, as you said, it's, uh, if you got, if your vision is to be uh, the biggest uh, producer on earth or to sell millions of liters, then you might need to go this way and say, okay, I need to do a product which suits to the, to the taste of a lot of people. But if your vision is to do an honest product where you can say, okay, I stand behind it and I really, I really love what I'm doing, then you need to do it another way around. If your vision is, of course, to make a lot of money, this is the wrong way. But. And then, uh, not so much talking about money, but then talking about future. So you've established, uh, you can be proud of what you've reached so far. Yeah. What is your moonshot in five, 10 years? Uh, post Corona, post COVID. So uh, post Corona, yeah. Let's say, um, yeah, let's say regarding Corona, I'm more like, uh, as I said to you before on the phone, uh, I'm a bit in trouble because KLM canceled all the international flights. So <laughs> I'm not like, I don't want to be, uh, yeah, let's say uh, too slow just because of Corona. I want to move and want to, want to as, as, as far as it's possible to develop my, my way. And regarding five years, I hope to, to have a small production running because I'm really into that. I'm just like right now checking every day as, as many times as possible, all the possibilities that are out there, checking, 
to get small uh, distillation equipment and everything. Just something that's possible for me because, you know, that 500 cast thing is uh, quite big already for me. So it's not, not the easiest way to grow in that way right now. But I think there are so many possibilities and also about being, you know, I already had a look on, on pricing for and talked to the guys in Panama pricing per kilo or let's say per ton of sugar cane. So to get really your own producer and to just to make some calculations and say, okay, if I pay them a little bit more and tell them I need this kind of quality or this kind of sugar cane being used, let's see what we can get. But uh, so let's say if I need to do a moonshot, I would say I would uh, love to taste uh, a fully artesano, 100% produced uh, rum in five years. Maybe the first one being aged already for three years in wood or so. So not starting to distill, but my plans are a bit, yeah, a bit crazy. So I, yeah, let's say no. I, I hope to, uh, yeah, to get that uh, done until this point. But problem is like right now, being on the one hand, the guy who's producing it, on the other hand, the guy who's selling it, it's uh, crazy. You need a bit of crazy dreams that, that keeps you alive. And I think that keeps you motivated looking forward. Yes, um, of course. Pedro, still there. Learnings with other producers, uh, brands, uh, in, let's say, pre-competitive sharing of knowledge and collaboration. Yeah. Um, uh, and for you, what uh, do you see a need for that, A? And B, uh, for you, what, what would it be? What would be the topics that you say, well, okay, this I would like to learn from my... You think, uh, you know what I think is... Uh, uh, bottling and selling wrong. You know, if if there would be a better community and a better connection, not only from producers to consumers or from producers to bloggers and to the, the people shouting out it outside to the market, but within the producers, I think that could help a lot because you can, yeah, you can discuss things and it's not about, I don't know how to describe this feeling. A lot of times I think the people are not talking to each other, the producers, because they are afraid of you are doing what they did or they're doing what you did. And, but I think if you share experience, it helps all of you. It's not like uh, sharing and then somebody else is doing it better. If you are afraid that the other guy is so much better than you, you should leave the market. That's my opinion. <laughs> Sounds a bit, maybe a bit crazy, but uh, I think every, every guy or every person in, in production has its own experience and everything and just if you discuss it on a normal way or if you got a connection and say okay i can write him or call her or ask her whatever um how she or he managed it that would be great because then you got a really really good exchange of experiences and that could help the whole rum business to get on the one hand better in quality and also because this is not only the main fact that that needs to be focused on because qualities are quite good if you really really look out there but also yeah. to to get better in distribution pricing and everything yeah true uh, um if you could pass on let's say the interview to someone else uh next in line uh who would it be yeah uh, i had some really nice talks and discussions with dick barber yeah um I can pass you his, his contacts. I think it's okay for him. I, I'll ask him on Monday because then we got the next call. And because he's a, a really small small rum producer right now in Panama. Just started some years ago and with the right intentions and the right way. And I think he's also yeah on a sustainable way and would be interested uh, to build up such a community. Okay. I'd love to hear. I never heard of him. Uh, would be great to connect. So if you can share the idea on Monday, um, that would be perfect. So happy to follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I think it's important, like you said, that you have that have that community. On one hand, I would say the ROM community is very every, many people know each other. On the other hand, it's very also very fragmented and very closed in terms of sharing knowledge, ideas. And I think talk about sustainability is not so much. It's an advantage for your business. Hey, you can save money. Uh, you can do better for the planet, 
but the planet is a very big planet. So if only one is doing it, now we need more <laughs> people and more companies doing it together. And why should you reinvent the wheel uh, yourself while your neighbor, producer, whoever is already doing it? So then yeah. it's better to open the doors, learn from each other and, and get better. And then on market competition and entering market, that's a different story. Okay, that's uh, competition. But mm. in doing good in your production and for the planet, I think that's a pre-competitive space um, where I think the, the rum sector as a whole could really do more and more. Mm. Um, I'd like yeah. to thank you very much for this, this interview, uh, it's, um It's amazing. I, I think I'm always fascinated with... Uh, I think everyone, like yourself as an entrepreneur, yeah, well, my interest is rum. I knew about it. Uh, I learned it. And I wanted to produce something myself. And then you just start. And you don't have all the knowledge. You don't maybe have all the networks and contacts. Uh, but like the ones I interviewed before, like you start, you learn, you connect. And from that point, you move on and you get better. And then you have your moonshot, as you just said. Well, hopefully I will have my own uh, distillery here. And we'll be producing this amount or this uh, other type of rum, focusing more, looking into rum agricole, whatever. Yeah. And I think that's um, the key message. Eh? Just do it, so to speak. Start, yeah, and learn, and you will fall, uh, but then you pick up yourself again and, and yeah. continue. And also, let's say just one more sentence, but being sustainable also in another way, which means, in my opinion, just to, to develop something that might not be useful for yourself, or may pay you 15 houses on this planet, which is nothing about being sustainable, but building something up which your children might be using or their children. So what I'm doing now, my great grandfather would have never imagined, I think. Mm. He would say, would have said the same as I said to myself, you're crazy. But uh, I hope that my great grandsons also say this once. So I think that's also a way of sustainable thinking think about what happens afterwards correct thank you very much sebastian Pedro, and, thank uh, you a lot we will be in touch and looking forward to uh well continue following you uh, on your journey and um yeah again thank you danke schön hope you have a good <laughs> snow this weekend we will send it from the netherlands up to you yeah, um you too. and uh like I said, hopefully, again, post-corona is coming. Uh, so we're hanging tight and uh, uh, you can travel again soon with KLM. It still yeah. exists then. Uh, to <laughs> <We> <laughs> <also>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Boat. <laughs> Thank Not you. So <laughs>